When we look at the issue of the King James translation and all of the debating and the, the heat and the judging and the vision that is caused by it, I, I believe the heart of God is, is grieved, not so much for the issue, but for the way the issue is portrayed and the way it's carried out. Sometimes people use this word, I think erroneously, to try to justify what they're, what they're doing and what they believe. For example, in Psalm 12, where the Lord talks about the idea of that His Word is purified seven times, uh, I've heard it said that that is a process whereby we have a pure King James Bible. But that cannot be a process because to say that would be to imply that God had given David a prophecy about what was to come in the future. And that would also imply that God's Word needed purification, that it was impure to begin with and needed that process in order to become completely pure. Further, that would say that everyone who lived before 1611 uh, did not have the pure Word of God. They had something that had to still go through the process. What God is talking about in those verses is the quality of His Word. He is absolutely holy and pure, and so everything He says is absolutely holy and pure. So when we look at what, what the Word of God says, or maybe I should say what it does not say about this issue, I believe that it, it grieves the heart of God when we look at all He does say about love for one another, about unity, uh, about avoiding the issues of division. I have to think that God is grieved at the way the issue has come about. On one side, you've got an arrogance and an elitism. On the other side, you've got a response to that that, that generates or festers a pride that, in a, their response, and then they develop their own arrogance. And the point is, that would indicate that both sides are inconsistent with what he says in his word. Now, as we look at what it has transpired in order for God to preserve for us his word, we know that when he spoke to Moses and, and to Matthew and to Paul, that every word he spoke was absolutely pure. And then he, he brought up a people, especially with the Old Testament, but the New as well. But the Old Testament, we see how he, he raised up a people for himself, and they had such a high regard for his word that their copies were just absolutely meticulous. Their methodology, the, the, the things that they used to ensure accuracy um, was certainly a super, superintending of God to bring to us the preserved Word of God. And then in the translation work down through the years, though it's not an exact science, it's not like a mathematical formula, still we recognize that God has preserved His Word so we can hold it in our hand and we can know, thus saith the Lord, for what it is. The reason I believe with all of my heart that the King James translation is the superior translation is because of the the manuscripts and the evidence of the line that they're from because of the scholarship and the piety of the men who did the translation and because of their methodology. The checks and balances in which they are continually checking one another has not been equaled in any modern translation today. When we look at the manuscripts, there were 2,200 that were available to them at the time, and the, the instructions that were given to the translators were that, that they were to use the Bishop's Bible inasmuch as it accurately portrayed what God said in the, in the manuscript evidence. So consequently, they worked on, with those translations, or those manuscripts, to bring forth the King James translation. An interesting fact is that no two of them agreed. There were differences between them, so all of them were somewhat impure. There had some, some additions or deletions in them that, that weren't exactly what they should be, but they were so clearly additions, they were so clearly evidence of their, the errors that were there that, that the translators could figure out through a process of, of weighing each one which ones were the gems of the Word of God. So consequently, God worked in them to bring about this translation. The scholarship that was there and the piety of the men 
has not been equal in modern translations. Most modern translations included people that were clearly ecumenical in their mindset, and many were even unbelievers. And so we have to understand that the scholarship and the piety or the, the uh, level of godliness that these men portrayed in their walk with God has been superior to anything that has been compiled together uh, for the modern translations. And then as we look at the system of checks and balances, they checked and rechecked and rechecked in such a way that it was, it was clearly evident. They were very concerned that they would have what God has said, not just their own opinion or their pet doctrine. They couldn't get by with it even if they tried because there was always someone to hold them up and say, now that's not what he said, look over here. And so we have an absolute conviction that this is in fact what God has given for us. Now, in 1611, God put together this translation for us. The translators themselves made the statement in their, in their preface to the edition, in which they said that this is one more perfect translation. They didn't claim it was the perfect translation, but one that was more perfect. And when you look at what that is, is saying, then we have to understand Remembering that translation work is not an exact science, we have to recognize the fact that there are some words of which there is some question. None of them would make any difference in doctrine or conviction or our life, uh, in how we live our lives, but, but they would be the types of things which some tr translators would think that the, this English word would fit better for this Greek word, while others would think, no, I think this word would be, be better. So consequently, there is an element of subjectivity, but in the absolute truths of, of God, they, they were absolutely consistent that this is what God has said. So there is nothing to fear in reading the King James and taking every word and recognizing, thus saith the Lord. There is nothing in there that would pervert the truth of his word. There is nothing in there that would cause anyone to doubt what he said. This is what God says. Now today, we have another line of manuscripts called the Alexandrian line. And the reason... I cannot fully accept what they're trying to do is because how their process and their uh, scholarship and so forth is in much more question than compared to those from the King James. Um, when we look at the Alexandrian line of manuscripts, though they claim to be older, I think that that has been answered and and those from the other side that make it plain the reason they're older is because we're not used. And so we understand that there is an argument that I haven't heard fully answered by anyone. And, but nevertheless, they're convinced that they have a superior translation because they're older manuscripts that it's based upon. Uh, and so we come to West Carton Hort and the modern translations now. Here's the thing, with the Alexandrian manuscripts that were used, we have to recognize that the translations that have come out of those still contains the energy of a word of God within them. I think the King James translation has more gems, more energized capsules of his word, shall we say, capsules of energy. Uh, but the Alexandrian manuscripts still have enough of the power of God's Word whereby people can be saved, they can grow, and they can mature in their walk with the Lord. Another factor is when you look at Bible believers, those that, that absolutely defend the authority of Scripture, but yet they hold to the Alexandrian manuscripts, while I think that they are mistaken in holding to that line, and in those translations, the fact is they still hold to the same doctrines that I do, that we do. They still believe what we believe. They live in a very similar way with similar convictions to what I do. So if, if the idea that Satan had perverted that, those translations in such a way that he has watered down the truth or he has eliminated some truth, he has failed miserably. It didn't work. 
The fact is, they are brethren. And the fact is, they are brethren who love the Lord, and they love His Word. I believe they're in error in thinking the other manuscripts are better, but or the other translations are better. But at the same time, we need to understand, from God's perspective, what He expects of us as His believers. When I preach, every message I preach, I am far more concerned about what God says in the translation than trying to defend something that stands by itself. I've heard it said that the King James translation is like a lion. You don't defend it, just unleash it. And I fully believe that, that what we need to do is look at what he says and obey what he says. And if we did, then we would be very, very careful to, uh, to not only stand where we should stand, but stand in the spirit in which God tells us to stand. I believe that those that hold to the King James translation there are, are very sincere. I don't question that. But there are three primary motivations that are given for believing the King James Bible. Let's look at them. One of them, I've heard it said that, bless God, I believe it, it is true. It is the Word of God. But when we look at what they're saying, they are completely subjective. They're, they are saying they believe it because they want to believe it, not because of any evidence at all. And they are of the opinion that that's the way it should be, and so bless God it is, and I believe it. But that is not a reason. That is just their subjective opinion about it. The second reason why I have heard people claim that they believe in the King James Bible is because that's what they've been taught. That's what they, they've been taught all their life. And what they're saying is that there's been a strong personality in their life that has convinced them, and they've accepted not only the position, but the spirit in which the position is given, and consequently, they stand as they stand. Now, that's the beginning of a tradition. And the Lord has clearly spoken about holding up tradition at the same level as the commandments of God. He calls it hypocrisy. He says that it's something that is, is worshiping him with your mouth, but not with your heart. And so we recognize that that is inconsistent with his word. The third reason why we believe the King James is superior is what I've already mentioned in manuscript evidence. The fact that the, the men who did the translation were superior in scholarship and piety in their methodology and with the manuscripts that they used. But there is even a danger here too, because the Lord says to avoid genealogies that create division. Now the context of course is speaking of the Jewish dependence upon genealogy to, for, their, uh, for their history, for their heritage, and giving them a sense of pride over Gentiles, and thus creating division. But the application goes in so many different ways and so many other issues. For example, landmarkism that, that demands a genealogy of Baptist preachers from the time of Christ and, and churches down through the time of Christ um, is using that genealogy as a basis of division, which is in defiance of what God says there. And the same with manuscript evidence. We're looking at a genealogy of manuscripts. And if that is the basis of creating division, God is not pleased because it ignores what he says about it. It's interesting that the word heretic means to choose for the purpose of dividing. So consequently, the, the concept of using this issue as a basis of judging others, as a basis of dividing from fellowship and breaking up fellowship, is really a form of heresy and needs to be seen for what it is. Not the issue itself, but the idea of choosing it to create division. Consequently, I read the King James Bible because I believe it is the superior translation. I'm convinced that when I hold it in my hand, I can say with all sincerity, with all, with all honesty, this is the very Word of God. I preach every word that is there. I, I take words and I focus on what he said without any concern at all that I'm not, uh, I'm not doing what he has said. I am not talking about what he has given to us in his word. My greatest concern is what he says in the King James 
And what he says in the King James is that we are to love one another in such a way that it marks us as his disciples. Consequently, that is the command that is most repeated in the New Testament. And consequently, we recognize that this absence of love, this even hatred and this anger and, and this harshness on both sides is something that must grieve the heart of God. So I urge you to stand where you believe, the, where your conviction leads you, but stand with the grace of God in you that you can be an instrument in his hand to hold forth, thus saith the Lord. The King James translation is like a lion. You don't defend it, just unleash it. <laughs>